You, the one life, the one creator, are on a timeless journey of self-exploration through the medium of illusory duality and gradients of density. You are not a person, you are not an ego, you are not a mind, nor are you a body. You are absolute reality, experiencing these temporary identities. You are waking up to the truth of unity via the dream of forgetfulness that causes you to feel separate. And with the perception of separateness, you experience lack and therefore fear and desire. Believing that you are a separate ego, you seek to unite with your true self. And this takes the expression of moving towards and being called towards qualities like honesty, togetherness, acceptance, openness and truth, a collective truth. But in waking up to the fact that you are never not your true self and that everything you experience is made of only that self that you are, you recognize that this very moment, no matter how it seems, no matter what it looks like on the surface, is a perfect state of natural unity. This moment right now is how self is coming to know itself and it's all a perfect unraveling, the perfect manifestation of that one soul that you are. Yeah. When we begin on this path, we believe ourselves to be something separate. We experience what we believe to be separate thoughts, separate emotions, and separate experiences. This separation is experienced as a result of a pre-existing assumption about ourselves, that we each possess our own consciousness. See, reality is a mirror. If you hold an assumption that your experiences, thoughts, and emotions are wholly your own, and are only being experienced by you, that is how the world will appear. You could almost say that reality is respecting your own free will to choose to view life from separation. And so reality mirrors this, and the seeker continues to pursue enlightenment from a point of view of desire, something to attain, something to become. Although fear is not a desirable experience, it's still doing the same as the desire for unity. It's doing the same thing, it's just taking the opposite approach. In the seeker's pursuit for oneness, it is overlooked that oneness is already the case, which compels reality to mirror it, thus true self remains hidden. In actuality, our reality is a shared one. There is not one thing here that is separate from any other thing. The truth of what you are is always only here. It is absolute unity. It's just one thing uniting with itself constantly in different ways and it is always only here and in this very moment everything is working out in your favor this is a stream it's carrying you regardless of what you do there's something leading you somewhere leaving traces of potential for a more unified experience there's an orientation that's moving away from denial of experience and toward an embracing and sharing and a collective truth and as we shed the identity we realize oh okay you know it was kind of being filtered experience was being filtered through an idea that i am separate so it's as if this one thing is having union with itself if that is even possible and that's where it gets tricky because there's no duality so somehow this thing still manages to express as a feeling of undividedness not two and if you are willing truly willing to begin to view your experience as shared, then this very non-dual nature will reveal itself to you. You're listening to the Non-Duality Podcast. This is Nick Hyam from nisagayoga.com. Joining me for this episode is Colette Davy, whose Instagram handle is that beyond duality. According to the Law of One, Infinity has become self-aware and is focusing into energy, which separates into patterns of creation called densities. As infinity, as the one, your journey of self-realization is the discovery or remembrance of an essential truth, your essential identity. In the law of one, a social memory complex known as Ra says, the one intelligent infinity 
invested itself in an exploration of manyness. Due to the infinite possibilities of intelligent infinity, there is no ending to manyness. The exploration thus is free to continue infinitely into an eternal present. You are every thing, every being, every emotion, every situation. You are unity. You are infinity. You are love, light, light, love. You are. This is the law of one. Yeah. So Ra, which is a social memory complex, actually comprised of a like a bunch of different beings that now call themselves as one thing. They're so unified that individuality is not lost, but they're one entity, if that makes sense. And that's what's happening to Earth. And we're humans, uh, just slowly, it appears. We've technically already moved from a third density to fourth density. And third density, we're caught in the separate view of things. And then the fourth density is this beginning of like a social memory complex, a place where nothing is personal, nothing is private. Everything is shared. And that's also why we have this call toward truth. We have this call toward honesty about what's actually happening. Because there's an orientation that's moving away from denial of experience and toward an embracing and a sharing and a collective truth. And something in us wants everyone to know it. So that's what earth is moving toward. And that's also where awakening comes in. That's also why this awakening movement is happening. Because of this movement into unification. It's starting to open up and we're starting to move into a way of living or being that's shared. And in the law of one, they call this the movement toward fourth density. The more we move into this fourth density consciousness, the less we have to express from individuality. So it's not to say that we lose our individuality, but that we begin to more and more realize that our role is a part of something bigger than ourselves, where the bigger picture that we are all one is seen more and more clearly. When we begin on the path, we feel very separate and our experience is very separate. We have thoughts that belong to our self, this this individual um, thing contained in the body. And our entire experience revolves around this thing. And then the more we open, the more even these levels of our experience begin to show themselves as impersonal. So, you know, you'll be, you'll be standing uh, on the bus or next to someone and you'll just feel like an edge of agitation. And then there's no personal story of yours. You're not agitated, but you feel an agitation in the room. And that's like the first, like, bleeding in of this collective. As soon as we're open to it, it's because the person next to you on the bus is agitated. You know, so we start all localized and our entire experience, even down to thought, down to emotion, down to memory, seems completely personal and localized. And then as we shed the identity, we realize oh, okay, you know, it was kind of being filtered. Experience was being filtered through an idea that I am separate. And that's why I wasn't, you know, knowing everyone's experience at once. But the more we open up, the more this actually kind of becomes possible. Like I'll sit in a room with someone and sometimes know exactly what they're thinking. And it's not surprising. You know, at the beginning of all of this, it is. It's like, oh, wow, how do you know my thoughts? What the hell? And, you know, when we keep things from someone, if, if I keep a secret, it feels bad. You know, because this openness, this, this thing wants to become one with itself, even down to the manifestation. Even the manifestation of multiplicity is moving toward a unified experience. Which is interesting because we say, you know, multiplicity is multiplicity. You know, you always have diversity this is just how this appears. This always appears as a multitude of things. But what's actually happening is, or what's being suggested is that the multiplicity itself is forming into something that mimics the one. This open, shared, 
loving, truthful um, community of society. When you get really close to someone, you begin to share in their struggles with them or their joys or their anxieties. It's not as simple as one person in your house is upset and the rest are fine. If you're closely knit, the oneness of things, the oneness of emotions starts to show itself. And you're like, why is this person in a bad mood? Because now they put me in a bad mood. You know, that's not because you're a separate finite thing that got influenced by another separate finite thing. It's actually one shared, um, like little localized collective mind among the two of you. And, you know, the more you keep private, the more you resist this, like, unification, this movement toward oneness, the more resistance it creates, the more secrets you keep, even if you want to be really literal, the, the, more, the more emotions you bottle up, the more things you keep to yourself because you believe that you can handle it the more strain you put on this movement that wants to open up, that wants to share, that wants everyone in the house to be experiencing the same thing because it's gotten, it gets worked through quicker. So this is actually a more efficient thing that's being moved toward, even though it's hard for us. You know, you're constantly experiencing unity, whether we know it or not. And this can be said in the absolute sense, like, you know, you constantly source experiencing itself. But you can also say that when you touch a chair, you know, and you close your eyes, can you differentiate between the sensation of your hand versus the sensation of the chair? You know, can you actually split the two? You know, no. It's just a vibration. It's a... It's a quality-less vibration. And sure, you could, you could refer to thought, but we, don't, we try not to do that here. So that is a glimpse of unity. When you fall in love, that collapse of separation, that is a glimpse of unity. And this is why we seek these things you know this is why we seek comfort why we seek companionship um why we're you know sort of amazed by nature and beauty because all of these things as soon as we interact with them they there are no separate things we completely forget that we're a me and that's a tree or you know when you when you like cuddle into bed at night when when you're so tired and you just want to snuggle and fall asleep you're not feeling like a separate thing getting into bed you're just feeling this amazing soft wonderful feeling with no subject and these are the things that we love most so you know all of these things actually funnel down into oneness. If you take a real close look at your experience, the things that feel the most separate, you know, ask yourself, what is it in my experience right now making me feel the most separate? And then take a look at that because it's not the case, you know. And with sensation work, this is probably one of the most valuable ways to glimpse it. If you want to feel like you're, you're one or you want to rather feel the oneness that already is with objects around you, you know, go touch something. And like I said, try feel the difference between you and the thing. That is a glimpse of unity. And it's not as if this multiplicity is going to disappear Although we're not sort of like roped into it, we don't fully believe it, it still runs parallel almost to unity. So when we're on the path, we're expecting something to dissolve and we want something to become one. 
We want to feel suddenly united. But the case is that it is already united. It is already one. And that's the little trick. It's like, can you get yourself to realize this is already the case? And then it's like, you know, I hear, oh, yeah, I know it's the case, but I don't feel it. That means you don't truly know it's the case. Because if you did, that switch would flip. And you'd be like, oh, my God, this has always been the case. So separation runs directly parallel to the experience of unity. You can never expect a separation to disappear. You'll always feel, you know, there's a person here and a person there, right? But the belief in it, often as a result of these things that we've been talking about, you know, a shared energy field, um, knowing each other's thoughts, or even just, you know, connection, love, all of that stuff really points to the fact that we're not actually separate. You know, if we were separate, what would these experiences actually feel like? That's a good inquiry. If you were actually separate, what do you think falling in love would feel like? You know, if you were actually separate, what do you think union with another would feel like? It would definitely not feel as good as it does. Because you'd always feel separate, but there are moments which you don't, right? And something that is is the case should always be felt, right? If you're a separate thing, you should always feel like a separate thing. So why are there moments that you don't? We seem to have a choice between lack or love. Lack is based on the perception of separateness. Life isn't whole. This isn't unity expressing as multiplicity, perhaps as a way to explore itself. This is separateness. I am separate. I am limited. And therefore I lack. Because I lack, I fear and I desire. So lack is divided into fear and desire. doesn't matter what you desire. What you truly are longing for is unity. We desire because we feel incomplete. Because we lack, we are deficient. And so we have to go out into the world in time and space to find the things that will complete us. So it's, it's coming from the position of scarcity and there's this dream of completion and that path overlooks the inherent abundance of natural unity we may hear about oneness and then we can't seem to find it because we're looking through the lens we're operating in the framework in the usual world view of lack fear as another submodality of the main modality of lack is the perception that I am insubstantial, I'm kind of fragile as a separate entity. And what do we ultimately fear? But disconnection. The ultimate disconnection, we believe, is death. Desire and fear lead us. And these, you know, although fear is not desirable, it's not a desirable experience, it's still doing the same as the desire for unity. It's doing the same thing. It's just taking the opposite approach. So I often get the question, yeah, but why am I not feeling overwhelming feelings of love and bliss and um, connection to all things? And why is it that life doesn't feel like the moment when I first fell in love? And because it's not supposed to. Those experiences... These moments of unity are like little breadcrumbs leading you to the idea that maybe things are not the way you think. They're little nuggets to be used for inquiry. Um, You know, why do I pursue these experiences? That's what experience wants you to ask. If we never had these things that sort of just stop us in our tracks and just collapse the separation we'd never seek them and we'd never seek truth so it's not that when you get enlightened you're just going to feel blissing out all the time you're not going to feel like you're you're in love that was a specific thing to lead you here and once you're here you don't need it anymore 
you don't you don't wonder why you're not feeling it because you know oh that was a little trace of myself that life left for me to lead me home it said you know i know you're lost in in the woods but i'm going to place a cup of hot chocolate every 3 kilometers you know to make you th- realize that you're not actually lost in the woods you're not there's something leading you somewhere there's something beyond what you can see even though you feel lost there's something leaving traces of potential for a better more unified experience and the paradox like i said is that if you use these breadcrumbs kind of to lead you home you no longer need the breadcrumbs you're completely satisfied with just boring stuff you know you could you could sit in a room and just be fine with nothing happening because it's just like you're home now and experience doesn't need to lure you anymore so when you're suffering it's exactly the same as um falling in love in the sense that although you know you want to feel the one and you don't want to feel the other they're both telling you something about your experience they're both saying hey you're misunderstanding something they're both little flags to say like hello why do you think this is a certain way with love we get oh my god why did this feeling end you know i thought i would be in love forever that's pointing you to the fact that there is a forever united thing here that you seek it's not a pipe dream and with fear you know why am i feeling this i hate this that's pointing you to the fact that there's a place that you don't have to feel it that's why i feel so bad and that's why loving feels so good because these two qualities are signatures left in the world of what we are so you know the new spiritual wave is also in sort of evoking these things whether people are into non-duality or not there's this new spiritual thing going on where it's like oh embrace everything love everything of course this has been going on since forever but it's got particular traction now um embrace your flaws you know body positivity mental health all of these things are movement toward unity they're actually accepting your experience that's actually what's happening so on a global scale things are moving but but people can't tell because they're too preoccupied with their own stuff you know but even in the little things even in just accepting a state even just accepting the state of one's mental health even that is already a movement toward unity a, a movement toward non-resistance so you know how much can you not resist that's another good question how much of life can you stop resisting and that doesn't mean you need to stop feeling bad about stuff because resistance and feeling bad are not the same thing you can feel bad about something happening or you can dislike something happening or you could wish it wasn't here but resistance on top of that is going to make everything way worse So where can you stop resisting? You must start when it's easy. Start when you're not supposed to be resisting, right? So start start when things are semi okay, you know, daily life kind of a little bit stressful. Don't wait for everything to burn down and then implement your practice of where can I stop resisting? You know, just when you're sitting in traffic, which is kind of annoying. Can I not resist this? Can I collapse? that which is making me feel separate right now can i glimpse even a small bit of unity without expecting it to be this enlightened explosive oneness with all things you don't need that you just need many of these small glimpses of unity and that's what we're moving toward as a collective both individually 
and collectively. A place, so to speak, of pure love and no fear. Absolutely. Love is, as you said, the collapse or the disillusion of the perception of separateness. What do we love? We love truth. We love wholeness. No matter what you love, you love yourself, your true self. Now that love manifests as resonance. For example, you listen to a teacher and you read a book and there's just something about it that feels right, feels homely, feels familiar, feels kind of comforting because on a deeper level, you know it to be true. And so we are called to follow the resonance, to delve into that deep, inherent knowing. So can you trust that resonance, that deeper knowing? Can you rest into that, abide there, follow that? That's your inner guru. That's the sad guru, the true guru. That deep knowing has been called Atman, the self beyond ego. You can feel it. So you know that you exist. You know that you're alive. You can feel your aliveness, your beingness. You're conscious of your consciousness. It's this easy, simple, natural feeling that you are. That is the beacon that lights the way. Nisargadatta says, The indwelling principle, I am, without words. Let us call it Atman, the self. You are that self, and you are not the body. With that conviction, you must meditate on that I am, that self only. By being one with your consciousness and treating it as your Atman, as your God, you can hope to attain what you think is the unattainable. So when you hear a spiritual truth, that indwelling principle is felt in such a vital and alive way. It becomes prominent in your experience and says, I am. It's a resonance. This is what I am. And here's Papaji. First see the self within you. Then you will see that the self in you is not other than the self in me. It is the same self. Then you perceive that the same self in you, in me, is everywhere else. And self alone is that self. There is nothing apart from the self. This experience you will surely get if you stick to self alone. Nothing else ever existed at all. The not self doesn't exist. You will see self everywhere. Yes. In the seeker's pursuit for oneness, it is overlooked that oneness is already the case, which compels reality to mirror it. Thus, true self remains hidden. In actuality, our reality is a shared one. There is not one thing here that is separate from any other thing. So this is a quote from Ra from the Law of One. I am Ra. We ask you to consider as we speak that there are no words for positively describing the fourth density. We can only explain what is not and approximate what is. Beyond fourth density, our ability grows more limited still until we become without words. That which fourth density is not, it is not of words unless chosen. It is not of heavy chemical vehicles for body complex activities. It is not of disharmony within self. It is not of disharmony, disharmony within people. It is not within limits of possibility to cause disharmony in any way. Approximations of positive statements. It is a plane of a type of bipedal vehicle which is much denser and much more full of life. It is a plane wherein one is aware of the thoughts of other selves. It is a plane where one is aware of the vibrations of other selves. It is a plane of compassion and understanding of the sorrows of the third density. It is a plane striving towards wisdom or light. It is a plane wherein individual differences are pronounced, although automatically harmonized by group consensus. So another function of this opening or of this movement to fourth density is to help us to be open about and accept parts of ourselves and our experience that have remained in darkened, so to speak. When stuff is out in the open, it's way harder to reject than when it's bottled up and we keep it to ourselves. When you walk into a room grumpy and everyone knows you're grumpy, in a way, like the seriousness of the grumpiness is taken away. 
yeah, he's grumpy today, you know. That makes us feel kind of accepted and we accept our grumpiness way more than if we had to walk in the room and pretend, for example, that everything's totally okay and that we're not in any weird mood or anything. We can even see this movement toward unity in things like the rise of social activism. Although these actions sometimes appear in the form of anger and resistance, they actually come from a deeper call toward challenging injustice and inequality. Something within us, some wiring, knows that we are one being. When we begin on this path, we believe ourselves to be something separate. We experience what we believe to be separate thoughts, separate emotions, and separate experiences. This separation is experienced as a result of a pre-existing assumption about ourselves, that we each possess our own consciousness. See, reality is a mirror. If you hold an assumption that your experiences, thoughts, and emotions are wholly your own and are only being experienced by you, that is how the world will appear. You could almost say that reality is respecting your own free will to choose to view life from separation. This is the same as the case of the seeker, right? The seeker wants to become one with all things, but underlying this need is an assumption that it is not one with all things. And so reality mirrors this and the seeker continues to pursue enlightenment from a point of view of desire, something to attain, something to become. And if you are willing, truly willing, to begin to view your experience as shared, then this very non-dual nature will reveal itself to you. If you can begin to notice the natural unity in life across many glimpses, many times, not just with people, but with things and your emotions, thoughts and sensations, there won't be any need for any big enlightenment boom. Desire itself is structured in such a way as to, like we've said, lead us to ourself. We desire connection, longing, intimacy, bliss and beauty. We desire all of these things that feel like a collapse of duality. When a desire is satiated, the next desire that follows is like often less material. It's more vague and less concrete. Everyone kind of knows a bit about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but for those who don't, it's this pyramid that illustrates how humans behave in terms of desire and need. So at the bottom, you have physiological needs like food, water, sex, sleep, and stuff, which are generally fulfilled first. And then as we move toward the top of the pyramid, the next layer is like the need for safety. The next is the need for love or belonging, like friendship, family, sexual intimacy. One above that, we have esteem, which relates to self-concept, respect for others and stuff. And that at the top, we have self-actualization, which Maslow conceived of as like morality, spontaneity, creativity, and acceptance. So the higher up the pyramid we go, the more our desires or needs become less concrete, less material, more formless. As we fulfill one desire, the next desire often relates to something deeper or more profound, until we seem to have the most formless desire of all, if you could call it a desire, the one for enlightenment. And this is exactly because life is leading us via these breadcrumbs to our one most true desire, our self. And the thing about this desire is that you don't fulfill it in the way that you fulfilled the rest. It's the one thing that paradoxically is already the case. In other words, this whole thing is set up in such a way as to lead you straight to what you're looking for. The very structure of reality itself is designed to enlighten you. In other words, what you're seeking is very much seeking you. We say that this dream is one of multiplicity, but what's happening here is that even the multiplicity itself is beginning to mimic non-multiplicity. So duality itself is starting to mimic non-duality. As what appears to be separate individuals, we experience connection with others. We experience friendship. We experience another's emotions, share in their joys or their grief. We experience timelessness when we're in the flow of creating art or doing something that we enjoy. We continuously see, feel, and experience these breadcrumbs of the absolute leading us to itself. So what do we do here? What's the lesson here? The lesson here is love. Recognition of love in every moment, in every form. You're going to have to abandon your normal idea of love for this one because the love of the divine far transcends what's known as love in the human world. Quo from the Law of One says this, 
If you can imagine a thought with the power to create the universe, then in your imagination you have seen love in its full meaning. Try ask yourself, can I see this very happening, whatever it is, as love in some way? The same love expresses itself as attention without a personal agenda, which is what we can use when we're suffering, right? Like, can I see the suffering with a loving attention, free of my personal agenda? Or even better, can I see it as love itself? The same love expresses itself as silence. So can I sit here and notice the silence that's already here? Can I sit here even when there's noise and see that it's happening within stillness? Or even better, can I see the silence as love itself? If you think about it, like we said earlier, when you're following truth, you're following resonance. This is another way of seeing this love, too. When we hear there's no separation, whether we believe it or not, right, something within us calls and says this resonates. You see, this resonance or this love requires no belief to exist. You don't have to believe in oneness to resonate with oneness. In fact, it's better if you don't believe anything. So, can you follow resonance? Can you notice that what is being pointed to is something much bigger than that which is resonating? When you're in connection with another, can you feel that very resonance as union itself? Yeah, I love what you said there. Um, the structure of life is designed to enlighten you. The unmanifest is manifesting as this moment right now. And it can't be any other way because it's this way. It's this presentation, these thoughts, these emotions, this body, this environment. All the various facets of this moment are exactly the structure of life right now. Like the presentation is right, but how it's conceived, it just misses the bigger picture because no thought, no concepts can encapsulate the entirety of, of what this is. The invitation always is to look beyond your words, your, your concepts, anything you think about it, and really get in touch with the actual isness, the suchness of that. And like you've been saying, wherever there's a, 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 an inkling of harmony or an inkling of spaciousness or flow or, or love or a collapse of separation and a kind of shining forth of light beyond the darkened places, go there because that will start to decontract those limiting places and the mask, the false ego separate self will start to crumble. You know, you don't have to jump to sudden awakening where there's just absolute oneness with all. Be patient with this process of realisation Take comfort in the possibility that this is already enlightenment. This is already truth. This is already reality. Yeah. So like at the beginning, you know, when we first, I don't know, when we first start to feel like the movement of desire, we think that like only certain experiences hold salvation. So it's like, you know, we know that like only this drug or only this person or only this relationship. Because we've had experiences from these types of things that give us a feeling of like transcendence or bliss or union, we think that, oh, I need to re-pursue that experience itself again and again and again. And that's how I transcend it, basically. And then like as we open up more, we realize like, oh, that wasn't telling me to repeat the experience. That was telling me that there's a possibility for these things to be experienced here and not necessarily via that modality. So, you know, if something is in darkened, it doesn't mean that it's in darkness. It simply means that it's hidden from light. So it simply means that something is not in clarity. So when we have this pursuit toward a pleasurable experience, the opposite is just as true. There's like, there's an option when we're suffer suffering, when we're in somewhere that's in darkened, there's an opportunity here 
that existed in the same way as the drug or the relationship or whatever it was, that external thing, whatever that gave you, the opportunity is here within this, this suffering. And it's not going to take the form of the same emotional response. It's not going to be the brain chemistry of those things. However, it's going to resemble something. You know, something about it is, I don't know, it's just, it has a similarity. I remember when I was really struggling, when I was first trying to wake up and I was suffering really badly every day and I was, I was so lonely and I really sought union, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And I was wondering, you know, why do I not feel one with everything? Uh, if I felt one with everything, I wouldn't feel so lonely. And then I was walking down my hallway at my, in my house and there was like a little lizard that was on the floor. And I was like, this lizard is by itself, and I'm by myself. And, and the lizard doesn't look bothered by being on its own, and I'm so distressed. And so I lay down on my hallway floor, and I, on eye level with the lizard, and I looked it in the eye, and it didn't run away from me, um, which they normally would. And so I sat there looking, or lay there looking at the lizard for like 10 minutes, and I just started crying because I was like, this... I realized in that moment that union is always possible. And it wasn't because I connected with something else. It wasn't because there, there were two separate things there, like a lizard and me, you know, looking at each other. There was a, a brief mutual acknowledgement of something deeper, as silly as it sounds, um, something that transcended the form of Colette and, and lizard. <laughs> and I realized that, like, the lizard or the experience of bliss or union or harmony is, is just a little signal for something way deeper. And then next time I was suffering, the lizard appeared again. But I didn't have to go lie on the floor with the lizard. It sort of hung out in my hallway. And I thought it was like some cute synchronicity because whenever I was really going through a hard time, it would be there. But I stopped going to go sit with it because I didn't need to anymore. Because I knew that the possibility of union was always there and it's like if I really need to lie down and look at the lizard or be with the lizard I can and that's like a metaphor it's like I don't need to feel lonely um the possibility of fulfillment is always there physical union like with the lizard spoke of something unspoken it was like hey remember this is always here. And just simply the comfort of knowing that that experience happened just healed my loneliness. I was not lonely again after that. And I could be by myself because I was like, wow, you know, this, how could this be? I've overlooked this my whole life. I could have just looked into the eyes of a lizard and, and, and felt, I don't know, like I never needed anything again. So, yeah. I found that like really significant and um, and it really ties into what we're saying. You know, it goes way beyond the physical stuff. Although the physical stuff can be a practice, like, you know, unite with others and um, see them as the creator, see yourself as the creator, see them as the creator. But that's a very, I don't want to say superficial, but it's it's a very, let's say, a manifested way of experiencing union. And if we can take that a level deeper and realize that we don't actually have to do these things, these things are always available. You know, it's more about their potential. You can always feel loved. Eventually you realize, oh, it's not the lizard. It's not the person. It's not the drug, the relationship. It's the capacity within myself inherently pre-existing that just got awakened or triggered as a result of this external thing, but I don't need the external thing to feel it. So with regards to union, the union that transcends all types of physical union is this one, this unspoken safety that just needs to be remembered. It's not that it needs to be found or cultivated or created with another person or an object or a substance at some point you realize oh that was simply a a thing that catalyzed something that was already within myself and 
whether there's someone here or not, a lizard here or not, I can feel that safety at any time because my loneliness was an illusion. There's always an opportunity for connection. And you might say, okay, yeah, but there's not always. So there might not have been a lizard that day, right? But maybe I could have gone and sat outside and looked at a tree, you know, a tree or the floor or the ceiling, you know. It's in everything. Union is in everything. Every sensation resembles union. Every visual perception represents union. If you look at something, the only thing that's keeping you separate from it is your belief that you're a separate thing. Without that belief, it's pure union. And that's what this experience is. And it's not union between one thing and another. So it's, it's not something that like can become unified or it can't unite it is union itself. It's, it's as if this one thing is having union with itself. If that is even possible. And that's where it gets tricky because there's no duality. So in the same way that we say you can't really be aware of because that's a duality, somehow this thing still manages to express as a feeling of union or undividedness rather, not to... So when we go into sensations that appear dark or painful or we're resistant to them, and we say this often, but it's so important, so we say it again, using this idea of union, let's see if in sensation you can find union. So in a sensation that makes you feel really separate, Can you find anything about it that is not separate? So you can look at it and think, I'm aware of the sensation. The awareness itself is not separate. Or you can try to find the borders of the sensation. If you probe it enough, you see, oh, the sensation has no borders. It's not separate from anything else. You can also love it which is another form of this union. So union as a practice, as a, as a gateway, is very powerful. You could also ask yourself, what is making me feel out of union? Where is the belief in me right now that's making me feel out of union? And it's not as if you're supposed to highlight the belief and be like, oh, someone solve it for me. It's just supposed to be seen as, oh, that's the belief that's got the, let's say, wrong foundation. That's the one that's making a mistake. Because this itself is absolute unity. It is absolute unity. It's just one thing, uniting with itself constantly in different ways. And, you know, you hear, yeah, but I'm trapped in duality. And what we're saying is, no, even when you're trapped in duality, There's union everywhere. And if you follow union right from, you know, if you're a beginner seeker, start with the union of the body and the breath. As you open up more, the union of awareness and what it's aware of, how it's not separate. And then the union of oneness, how everything's made of the same thing. This union takes you the entire way. And it can be applied in an emotional way to shadow work. You know, in what way do I feel not united with my partner? In what way did this event in my childhood make me feel not united? What about it separated me out? You know, if you investigate, you realize, oh, all of these things that were so traumatic for me, these things that have caused me the heaviest burdens are the times that I felt not united. I felt isolated. Uh, humiliated, anxious, separate, out of union. Exactly. Gabo Mate says, the essence of trauma is disconnection. So the real question is, how did we get separated and how do we connect? At the heart of the experience of trauma is a fundamental, often existential sense of disconnect, a sense of inner fragmentation, a loss of wholeness. Healing is wholeness, is the recognition of wholeness. It's not to make whole, not to become whole. It's the 
realization of the existing wholeness. And it's like, it's calling out to you. It's all calling out to you. It's like, I'm here for you to know truly and deeply and intimately and that you are absolutely undivided. I remember when I was a self-help junkie and I listened to Brian Tracy a lot. I remember him saying, and it's something that stuck with me and I feel is relevant to what we were talking about and what you mentioned earlier. There's a possibility of being an inverse paranoid, someone who sees that everything that happens is conspiring in your favour for your greatest good. So if we apply that to what we're talking about, like you said earlier, and I keep repeating because it stayed with me because I feel it's really powerful, the structure of this moment is manifesting in such a way to remind you of this natural unity. Like you said, everything, even though this sounds like more empowerment, it, it is true. Everything is working out in your favor. This is a stream. It's carrying you regardless of what you do. You know, our initial instinct as soon as we're suffering is I want out of this. And eventually when it doesn't leave for long enough, we're like, God oh, damn, I, I have to use it now. Like, you know, when when fear arises, it's actually just because of a a misbelief. It's it's one step away from something. It's one step away. It's simply it's pending a realization that I'm believing something that's incorrect. With the seeker, you know, seeking feels bad because it's coming from division. Everybody wants to stop seeking because you're seeking as something separate and you're, you're seeking to become this all one. But, and then people ask me, but okay, then I'll, must I just stop seeking? And I'm, and I'm kind of like, who's that? You know, now, now the one that's not one or thinks it's not one wants to stop seeking as another method to try to become one. You see, any activity from division is just getting off on the wrong foot. So, you know, even when someone asks me, you know, should I sit? It depends where you're coming from. Truly, it's not always the case that you should meditate, actually. It's not always true. You know, you think, let me just meditate. But if you're meditating to sit this thing away, or if you're meditating to reach a certain state of consciousness that you're attached to, it's it's not even useful. It's not even useful. And the trick is you you can't choose either side. You can't be like, oh, I'm gonna seek as a seeker, or I'm gonna stop seeking as a stop a seeker stopper. You know, either either of those things, you're choosing to be something, right? You're choosing to adopt an identity as either the seeker or the one that stops. And then people are like, okay, but then I'll just do nothing. You know, but doing nothing is then the one that does nothing. So the truth about your experience and what you are doesn't, it's not held in what you're going to do tomorrow. Should I stop seeking tomorrow or should I have done that? The truth of what you are is always only here. It is always only here. And in this very moment, you're not a seeker. In this very moment, you're not a seeker. You're only a seeker if you're moving forward in time. You're only a seeker if you're moving forward. Or if you're thinking back, oh, I've spent 20 years seeking, or I've spent five years in an ashram, why am I still not awake? I've learned all this stuff. Like, this is such an important, delicate mechanism. As long as the mind, I always say, like, as long as the mind is either in the past or in the future, you can't settle it, even as a seeker. So all the stuff you've learned in the past, that doesn't exist here. You, you can only retrieve it if you go back. And being a seeker of salvation or a seeker of transcendence happening in a moment from now or you're anticipating it or you're, you think it's going to happen on the next retreat or next satsang, that's not how it works. If it happens to happen, then it's because you had a moment of nowness, irrespective of your anticipation. So... This planning, the seeker planning, or like seeker regret, or the the accolades that are carried by us. <laughs> it's like we were so devoted to something, we were so passionate about something that we devoted everything to it. But then when you know everything, it's like, all right, it's time to now only be now. 
It's time to abandon everything I know. And it's not in the way where you do nothing. It's not abandoning in the, in the sense of like, oh, okay, stop. I'm stopping seeking. Uh, let me, I'm stopping. Ha, 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 nudge, nudge, wink, wink. You know, it's, it's a true realizing that none of what you've learned can explain what's happening in this moment. And I also hear, yeah, but I know that. But then you're referring to knowledge again. You're going back in time again. So how can you stop your mind? You know, although we can't control our thoughts, we can definitely sort of dissolve them. We can definitely, as soon as we see a thought arise that speaks on behalf of this thing living in the past or this thing that's going to get enlightened in the future, we can just say, shh, and we fizzle it out. Because it's not conducive. It's not going to help. So over time, we learn to like fizzle these these things out that tell us we need to be anything other than what we are now. And paradoxically, as soon as we start to fizzle these thoughts out, reality shows us that we're not anywhere other than where we're supposed to be. So, And then in hindsight, we're like, oh, it was just the thoughts. But when we're enveloped in the thought, you can't see that. So the only way really is to stop being a thing. You know, you've got to stop being a thing and you can't stop, you can't, be a thing that's stopping being a thing either. And all of this is mind stuff. So if you don't want to be a thing, just step out of the mind. Just just fizzle these thoughts out. As soon as they arise, just gently let them go. Gently let them go and return to here. So you said, you know, you're existing as. That's the problem. You're existing as. Um, the entire way one's existing as, even as a seeker, you're still an as. Even as awareness, you're still an as. That's the hardest thing, you know, because it's impossible to imagine an existence on its own but does not have an identity. And when we say self, people take that self and they make it a personal self. Now it's a personal shared thing. You know, um, and that resembles oneness. It resembles at the absolute, but it's like it's a pseudo version of what we're actually talking about. What we're actually talking about is like true no self, true non existence in the sense that you're not existing as something. As long as you're as something, there's, there's as something else, right? There's as something else. So suspend belief and you think like, oh, that's so difficult. And it's not, you know, belief is not a consistent thing. It's not what you think. We think we have like this belief bank, this repository of beliefs. Like how do I suspend my belief? That's not even true. A belief, it only exists in the moment that you, you sort of recall it or you bring it up. And the reason why we believe we have like a consistent experience of beliefs, like I believe stealing is wrong is because as soon as the topic of stealing arises we regurgitate that same thought i believe stealing is wrong then six months later when the topic comes up in conversation again i believe stealing is wrong so we think that belief has been here the entire time but it's actually only been here twice so when you're seeking if you're believing you're something separate that belief is only here now you can suspend it at any time it's not some kind of thing you need to erase like people say, but how do I stop believing I'm a person? You're not believing you're a person. A belief arises on occasion, like a thought. It doesn't have continuity. A belief is a thought. It's a recurring thought, maybe with an emotional response. So look, you're not believing you're a person. You have a thought that says, oh, I'm separate, then it's gone. And maybe you have a feeling of locality. But if you can shed the, oh, I'm separate, or if you can let it dissolve, then you can just work on the feeling of locality in the body. Then you're already miles ahead. Yeah. So be absolutely honest with yourself right now. If you feel like a separate person, despite everything you've heard, all these promises of the oneness of ultimate reality and you are always that no matter what, you've now heard enough. Even if you've just heard one teaching, you've heard enough. <laughs> It's enough. So now be here now and be honest. If it feels as if you are limited and you're not the entirety of what is, and if you feel like you are localized, a separate person, 
be honest and work with that. Describe that feeling of feeling separate and use that as your portal into what we're talking about here. Because the beauty of this is that anything is a portal. Multiplicity is a manifestation of the one self. So therefore, manifestation is the self mimicking itself as apparent separateness. So in that sense, it's this kind of almost fractal-like, ever-blossoming depiction of that one self. That's great news because anything, any experience is a, is a portal, is a doorway to truth, to realisation, to unity. Feel that sense of feeling separate and go into that. Use that as your doorway. You know, it's, that's the beauty of it. Use that as your doorway, as your entrance into what we're describing here attempting to point to this is all the representation the representation the presentation the revealing of that one that indescribable one so be honest and if you feel localized describe your experience of feeling localized that feeling of localized has a certain set of characteristics like anything like the glass I'm holding here has a set of characteristics so initially there's there's the word glass and then I can zone in to that experience and remove the word glass and all the implications that the word glass and the concept glass seems to uh, bring and then just describe the more subtle characteristics of this experience. So and you can do the same with that sense of feeling like a separate localized person. So does it seem to have a location? Be honest. If it feels like it, it's at the centre of your chest, then that's where it seems to be. So you've now found that separateness. You've found the separate self. Go into that sense of feeling separate and just describe the, the various characteristics, the elements that it comprises and just then strip them away. Drop those and then go into the raw energy the very sensory experience of that beyond any concepts. And what do you find there? Yeah, it's so interesting because we thought, we believe that this is the separate me. But it's not. It's nothing like the separate me. It's only, it's only that indescribable isness. And you'll find that that undescribable isness it's the same isness that all is it's like this opportunity to delve into any aspects any apparent aspects of that and you'll you'll only find home this is home you just have to look beyond the superficial covering of ideas and concepts as you said you you can't find when you really feel it you can't find a a like a line or a border around that energy because it's just pure energy. I'm just using an, another word. You could call it anything. You could call it beingness. Just, you, you could call it nothing. But the point is, there's no separateness there. There's no border there that's splitting you off because it, it's no longer an identity. You no longer identify with that because how can you? How can you identify with something that isn't bordered? There's no, there's no possibility of identification where there's no separateness. You know, those borders are seen through. They're not removed. They're seen through. You realise that there are no borders. There are no lines around what you take yourself to be or anything. So that how, how is it possible to identify with that? How is it possible to call anything anything? So that doesn't mean then you go around and not call anything anything. Or even refer to yourself you just know the true nature of what you're referring to and that the true nature of what you're referring to is this one unity, this one whole that you are. You know, the opportunity is to recognise that. Yeah, like probably the most important, most fundamental thing of any of these practices is like finding the ingredients of the thing that you're working with. Like when people ask me, you know, how do I stop being separate or feeling separate? I often ask, what are the ingredients 
of that feeling of separation. That's your first step. Like you said, I don't know if you said constituents or, but like the elements that make up this feeling. Because just like the self, you know, um, I often compare it to like, a, if you ever watched a game of rugby and there's a scrum, the ball's in the middle and there are a bunch of players around the ball and the self looks like that, right? But when you go and look inside the scrum, there's no ball. So when we say there's a self in my chest, right, that comes from asking what are the ingredients of the self. So if you're feeling separate, like what are the ingredients of my separation? Okay, well, feeling in the chest, mm, the, the thought that I'm separate, okay, and what, however many ingredients, you know, that you have, just identify them all. And basically, on investigation of each of those ingredients, we realize, oh, this is a rugby scrum with no ball in the center. There's no self in the chest. There's no self in the thought. There's no self in belief. You know, so it was only an appearance. It was a mirage. It's like as if the self is pre-assumed and says, hey, this pre-assumed thing is here. But the, the thing that said I'm here doesn't exist. And that's what we realize when we go into these things. And like the good news is you're never out of the training ground. The good news is practice is always here and it's always happening. And you can always accelerate the practice. And like we've said again and again, don't do this to try to get rid of anything. It's not, that's not the idea, right? Um, you're trying to underpin what are the ingredients of the thing that I believe to be one thing, right? You think you're one thing. You think you're one separate entity called a separate self, right? Or you think you have one. Okay, so why is it that this thing that you have one of can be split into an array of things? It can be split into, say, a sensation in the chest, often or behind the eyes. People say, I'm behind my eyes. But when you look behind your eyes, what do you find? Sensation, vibration. There's no little little me with a, with a poster saying, hey, I'm a separate self, waving a flag. So we just look at it again and again. You know, oh, wow, this really doesn't have a self in it. This really doesn't have a self. This, oh, I thought there was something here, but there isn't. You know, and that's, that's why the ingredients are so important. And like you said, you know, just you can find what is there. There's no separation there, but you can find that there's being there, right? There's existence there. In each of these ingredients, there's existence. There's a feeling of, of consciousness, vitality, something like alive, not hard to describe. And if, you can't, and if you can't find what is there, right? Find what's not there, at least, you know? Okay, there's not a self there. There's not separation there. There's not a border there. There's not, not union there. Exactly. There's not a self there. There's not a, a me there. There's not even the ingredients there. It's just energy. Well, is it just drop the word energy as well? Because is it really energy? Is it that concept energy? No, it's what energy points to. That's so important. Don't try to accumulate a new identity inquire into the identity you already believe to be true and then you won't arrive at a new one you'll be what you are already you use the word ingredients and that's a really good that's a really good way to talk about this as a really simplistic uh, metaphor you bake a cake and there's an, a concept applied to this thing so it's cake but if you kind of reverse engineer it and take it apart if you were to analyze it or if you filmed yourself baking the cake and then you played it backwards and you looked at all the different ingredients that you put into the bowl, do you find a cake in sugar? No. Do you find a cake in flour? No. Then if you go into the sugar, go into any of the ingredients, do you find sugar in any of those molecules that create sugar? If you look beyond the word sugar, you don't, actually don't find anything in those ingredients. And it's the same with this, this sense of self. So it's a self. It's a cake called self. Now reverse engineer it. Just, just experience the various facets of it. And in, in those facets, you don't find the facets. There's just the unnameable isness of what is. Mm, 
Yeah, the separate self is only the sum of its parts. It does not exist. Yeah, it's ex that's such a good metaphor. It's, yeah, it just appears to be something, but we've heard this a thousand times. You know, we just, we've heard it appears to be something separate, but it's not. But this is actually useful. This is actually useful. Reverse engineer. Yeah, reverse engineer your sense of separation. Yeah. Because there appears to be something, so like it appears to be a cake. But if you play it in reverse, when you started making the cake, there was no cake. There was no cake somewhere. Because sometimes people think, oh, but there's still a separate self, even though I'm looking at these ingredients. No, no. In, in the absence of, or let's say in the, in the presence of investigation into the ingredients, there cannot be... Uh, another existing self if there is that's another one of these cakes that actually doesn't exist that's only the sum of its parts again so you might have two or three of them like oh but there's still this one and that means the separate self does exist now nah. it just means that there's another thing masquerading as a thing even though it's only its ingredients yeah, and yeah, the deeper you go, the more the more you realize even these ingredients didn't point to anything. So you can you can just make work of it, really. You know, um, like you said, make work of your feeling of separation. The honesty is so important. If if you're not honest, you can't get anywhere. Um, you have to be super humble and super honest with yourself. Because if you if you're not you, you're not letting this separation be seen, you're saying yeah, but I know I'm not separate actually, you know. But inside you know that okay, you still feel located or you still feel like a seeker, and in admitting that you're already one step closer and looking at it, and like some people think that sets them further back, you know. I mustn't admit that I'm separate. Well, I mustn't admit that I'm a seeker because I'm going to be set back, but that's just the mind tricking you because it doesn't want you to see it. It wants you to hold a belief that you need to like resist something because as long as you're resisting it and you don't want to admit it and you're not being honest, you're not looking at it, right? You're, it's, it's closed. It's closed. You're putting it at the back of your mind that you're not enlightened yet. I don't, I don't want to talk about the fact that I'm not enlightened. I'm just going to attend all these these satsangs and stuff, and I'm not going to admit it. But as soon as you admit it, the ingredients will come up. You'll feel that feeling in your chest. You'll feel the belief. You'll feel the thoughts, rather, that say, I'm separate. Each of these things that comes together and creates this thing called a self. When, and then once you're there, take a look at them even deeper, and it's just what is. It's just vibration. It's just what is. And it's not a void there if you are to investigate any of the ingredients that create this cake of self, separate self, and, and you find that there is this unnameable energy, that unnameable energy of reality isn't a lack. It's not emptiness. It's empty of the concept, but full of what it actually is. You know, I think sometimes there can be this fear like, oh, if I do that, then I'm, what if I find nothing? And that'd be really scary. I'd, I'd actually, don't, on one level, I don't actually want to lose my sense of a separate self because at least I know that it gives me a groundedness or a security and it's familiar. And although I feel like I'm being called to uh, awaken to or called to truth or whatever, or this something in this teaching resonates. On one level, I actually don't want to lose a sense of separateness because it's what I know. Even use that. So if there's fear there, then go into the fear and do the same thing. Reverse engineer that cake of fear. You know, anything can be used. But it's really important to be honest. Somehow revealing is healing. You know, to reveal that, to speak it out. This is where I'm at. It's okay that anything may arise. It's okay to refer to yourself as, as me or as I, because you know that that me or I is only that. You can have your cake and eat it. You can refer to things and know that those things are not things. This is an opportunity to experience and explore yourself. You know, when you said revealing is healing, you know, that is exactly what's happening 
with um, state of consciousness and within individuals as well, as well as collectively. So like more and more, like we've said, we're being called to truth. That means more and more we're being called to honesty with ourselves. And like you said, it's good if we can sit and we can share with someone because that is another example of this like this manifested version of unity, this, this mimicking um, connection with someone else, you know, someone helping you, someone supporting you opens into, oh, I'm actually always supported, whether the person's here or not. You know, if you see a therapist or something, you know, eventually you don't need the therapist anymore. And it's not because all your problems are solved. It's just because you realize that the support is inherent. Um, and that's what's happening with this movement into the fourth density, as Law of One calls it. Everything is coming into the light. It's not even going to be possible to keep stuff from someone else in in with, across the involvement of human consciousness to come. You're already sharing stuff. When you're on the train with people, you have no idea, but you're feeling everybody's things at once. Um, there were recently like documents released from the CIA in which the CIA stated that uh, individual people are energy fields and we share in each other's energy fields. This is CIA material. So this movement is happening and it's calling for truth. It's calling for transparency, not only in with other people, but within oneself in every single way. You can't stay as this private thing anymore. It's going to be hard. It's hard to admit where one's blind and it's hard to enlighten that which has been in darkened but the reason why we're being called to it is because it's a collective movement and we have no choice this is what what's becoming of humanity we're all healing by revealing <laughs>